look, it's something I think about on a very regular basis. I'm like, I don't really know if I'm an artist or not. I mean, sure, I like making things, but am I, am I a craftsman or a am I a craftsman or am I a yeah, is, a, or am I a documentarian? It's a good question. And maybe sometimes I make art, sometimes I don't. Welcome to the Fine Fruit Bowl, a platform dedicated to the discussion and the exploration of art and the creative process. I'm your host, Ines, and in this week's episode, I have the chance to talk to the incredible Andrew Worcester. Andrew is a photographer currently based in Melbourne, Australia. With a history of extensive travelling, Andrew explores the way in which we consider and define the spaces and places around us. He has shot work in many different countries, such as Japan, Italy, and France, using photography as a vehicle to document the everyday. I'm going to start where I start with everybody, which is just tell us a bit about yourself and how you became a photographer. Uh, well, I've look, I've always kind of taken photographs. Um, my, I remember being, oh, six years old, and my father owned an advertising agency in, uh, well, we were in lots of places, but we lived in Australia. And he, we went on holidays. We would go to New Caledonia, Fiji, Fiji or Tonga. And he always had a oh some sort of camera um, and I sort of very much enjoyed um, just using taking photos of that and, you know probably weren't very interesting um, and then a few years later I was living in New Zealand again my father's business was diverse and he lived in lots of places um, and he had a very very interesting guy come and stay with us for a couple of months whose name is Paul Cawley and he was the original chief designer at Saatchi in London. Um, wow. So he worked for Saatchi and Saatchi. Um, <laughs> worked for Charles Saatchi. Um, and he stayed with us for a couple of months. And he looked at, I had lots of drawings around. And he was like, you'll be a photographer for one day. I'm like, yeah, right, <laughs> okay. Crazy old man. Um, and like, I mean, that was probably in the back of my mind somewhere for many years. And I was like, I bought a camera when I was about 15 or I was given a camera when I was about 15. And look, I've always carried a camera. And then I went to eventually, look, I went to university and started graphic design. Um, I've, I, I did a, I had a regular ongoing um, internship with an artist when I was in high oh. school in, in Michigan in the States. So we would do like three or two or two, three hours maybe on a weekend morning or afternoon and with oil painting. And she took me to my first uh, life drawing classes. Um, so I did lots of life drawing. And then I went to university, started graphic design and history, I took photography classes there. Um, and look, I knew a few people who were really cool who were, who were photographers and they were always a bit of an influence on me. Um, and so it was always just a big part of my process. Eventually I went to Europe when I was 23, 20, well, 25 actually. And I shot 35 rolls of film in six weeks. Wow. Uh, <laughs> wow. A third of which I lost in Paris because I'd had <laughs> too many, too many absence. Um, <laughs> I came back and I I put two of the prints on a wall in a bar here in Melbourne and both of them sold. I was like, oh, oh wow. my God, that's kind of cool. It wasn't massive amounts of money, but I was like, huh, that's, that's an interesting, that's an interesting, you know, first go out, you make a good chunk of cash. I'm like, yeah. oh, this is fine. Okay. And I was, I'd been tired of being stuck in my painting studio at that point. I had a studio where I paid about 200 bucks a month and shared with a bunch of people and like, I felt like I was yeah. kind of endlessly repeating myself. Um, and that thing of Paul Coley going, you'll be a photographer one day was always in the back of my mind. So I pulled out these, all these hundreds and thousands of prints. I was like, all right. So I made that in Paris or Venice or Berlin or Rome or whatever. I'll just start, keep on doing it. And so I started making pictures here in Melbourne. Um, this is pre digital. Yeah. Um, so I'm shooting film, shooting lots of Ilford film. Uh, may, yeah, mainly black and white, but also color stuff, um, buildings, architecture. Um, and then that was just before the digital revolution. And I'd say like within 18 months, I bought a DSLR, which obviously changed the whole process. And then 
just kind of kicked on from there and I kind of kept on doing little exhibitions, little bits and pieces, but very much sort of based on architecture, um, urban scenes. Um, and then eventually I kind of got into, I bought some lights about eight, ten years ago and started shooting portraits. Um, and, you know, now I've shot portraits for politicians, um, wow. big ministry bodies, um, all the, and like, and then during COVID, it was like, all right, can make pictures of things. I like books. I like, I studied graphic design. This is where the photo books now thing came from. So I kind of yeah. kicked that off. And um, yeah, that's, that keeps me quite busy um, yeah. in a good kind of way. I've had three pretty big people. Well, I've had three submissions in the last week of people who want to produce books. Wow. Um, one guy who's been published in the Wall Street Journal and a whole bunch of cool stuff, which I have to keep hush hush, but we'll hmm. sort out some legal contracts and release the information when we can. Um, but it's just a, it's what keeps me alive, you know? Yeah. Keep him busy, keep him doing stuff, keep him, it's kind of like creating more projects for yourself. But also, what I like though, and we'll get into it much later about the photo books, but like I like the fact that you're giving back to other people as well as just doing stuff for yourself. I benefit from the whole process because my name is on the website. And, yeah. But like I also, you know, people like democratization of media over the last however many decades has been, it means that like if you have the time and the wherewithal to make it happen, you can do anything. Like, yeah. You know, the first books I made, which is that actually don't actually exist anymore because they were done on print wow. on demand. Um, so that's this was done in I did it through Blurb, which was expensive and crazy and but fairly good quality. Like uh, there's like fifteen of these around the world, which is just kind of cool. Whereas then, yeah. you know, I was like trying to rationalize things further down from a money perspective. Yeah. Um the end was like this is the mo more, most recent one, which is the coastal book. Um, and then there's the preceding one from that, which is a suburban book. Um, and then there's another one, which I'm just about to finish in the next, hopefully, six weeks or so, which is the urban book. And then, like, and you, you look at that, which is hardcover, you know, dust cover, all the rest of it, to smaller, lighter, yeah. much easier to move around. Like, yeah. you got to have a different product. Like any business, I suppose you got to have a lot of different product levels. Yeah, of course. Uh, and so, like, you know, the, you can make one of those for 15 bucks, hmm. um, whereas the other ones, they cost 30 bucks each yeah. to make. So you just got to figure out how to kind of make it all fit together. Yeah, I think it's such a good idea. Such, uh, but the thing is that it, it must be, like, a lot, as you've already said, like I said, a lot of work though, because it's not just, oh yeah, just send me some images. It's like, we need to plan this, we need to think about this, we need to, you know, do the whole selection process. The artist has to be happy with the book itself and the work itself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I send out, you know, you get to a certain point of, of the design process and you send out a PDF to every single contributor. Yeah. Uh, every single person will come back to you with notes. Yes. Uh, and a lot of them are just like subjective observations. Yeah. Um, I'm just like, I'm really pissed off about this. Uh, yeah. And, but it's like you got to find a way to make all the different bits and pieces work together. But I have friends that help me edit. Um, yeah. So like I've each, pretty much every book will say, look, you know, this person helped me edit it. Um, sometimes it's my mom, even at age 45, because she's, hmm. you know, she's, she's got perspective on things and she's not a photographer. Absolutely. Or a person. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and she's like, sometimes it's like, well, look at this like this. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. She has corporate world experience, but doesn't have creative experience. Yes. Um, so finding a way to fit all the, like, looking at different audiences and what have you is, it's, it's, it's really complicated. But it's fun. It's a good challenge, you know? Yeah, that sounds like a challenge. It's something that I would love to do in the future as well, this idea of creating photo books or just the idea of creating something physical. I feel like yeah. photography, photographers rarely ever print their work. And I think we yeah. need more like physical work from photographers. Like I, I actually attended an exhibition yesterday over in Tamworth um, with a photographer called Tworth. I don't know if you know her work. I know um, her. She's actually, she's in my newsletter next six or eight oh, weeks. 
Perfect. Yes, I, I saw an exhibition yesterday in Tamworth because the last day I thought I'd hop on a train over. Um, and it's nice to see a photography exhibition. It made me think like we need more exhibitions for photography. We need to kind of, I don't say like elevate it because I don't think it's necessarily elevating, but I feel like we need to kind of put more emphasis on like photography as art, I think. I mean, I have I have a, an archive of prints which I've been printing for, oh, just of my own stuff, which I've been printing for about 15 years. Wow. Uh, and I don't do them all the time. Look, I've in the last year or so, I've kind of chosen to not work full time, so I'm pretty bloody poor. But I'm building something out of it, and like people yeah. are coming to me now to produce books. Um, yeah. Still not making any money, but I feel like on the right track, in the right time, with all the various yeah. things that I do, it will come. It will come together. And I don't like. I don't do it to make money. I do it because I love it. Um, but the money would you know, be nice. hundred percent. Like, like I mean, there's but, yeah. Looking at so one of the things that I'm working on right now is incredible guy in Blackpool, Nick, Nick Parkworth. Absolutely, absolutely adore his work. I was going to meet him when I was in Blackpool. We didn't get around to it, but he's an absolute wonderful guy. Um, so we are in the process right now of finishing a final selection, um, and I'm modeling. I'm looking at printing. Look, I've, been, I've basically got an idea of how I want the book to look. look. Um, and in the next, say, six weeks, I will, like, just put quotes out there and then begin to design the book itself. Um, yeah. And it's just that, like, I've known him since we were on, we've been on Flickr together since wow. when I was there, since 2005. Um, oh, okay. And I feel like I met him pretty early on. Um, so I've known his work for a long time. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, there's one or two other people who I'm in that same sort of realm with. I just believe in their work and they deserve an audience. And that's kind of, you know, that's the process. Yeah. So how long does that actually take from, like, say somebody reaching out to you to submit to actually having a final book done? I have a friend who's a pretty senior consultant in EY. Um, and he's like, you need to gauge your time. I'm like, yeah, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> I need to get one of those apps where I know where, when or how long I'm working in this app or that app for my computer. Yeah. Um, look, the initial stuff is a couple of weeks um, of like sporadic work, like two, two hours a day. Then there's then you, like a lot of stuff, you leave it alone for a little while. You do a bit of a cull. Um, I feel like the last process is probably a 45, 50 hour kind of thing because you're yeah. looking at perfecting things, removing imperfections. Uh, and despite, I mean, they're good quality books, but they're still not like a friend of mine, Dan, who was in the first Suburban book. Yeah. He's like, you could take all of the images and adjust the toning so every the tone of every image is matched across the 120 odd pages. Yeah. Um, which, like, I totally get that, but that, that's not the whole level of things. And like, I I almost take pride on the fact that I do it entirely myself. So it's oh, like, absolutely the one man show. I mean, I have amazing yeah. people that help me out in some respects. Um, my friend Sarissa helps me with the newsletter. Um, there's other people who just give me creative, you know, creative criticism and there's business advice and there's other stuff. Um, but it's my thing, you know, um, which I'm trying to, which is why I'm trying to figure out a better workflow, yes. um, a better way to figure it out and to be able to make more things. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like as somebody who does something that takes a long time by themselves i definitely can relate to that like it's it's a case of like you want to make sure that you're doing something really well but also that it's done to your standard because you're putting your name on it at the end of the day yeah exactly i mean the entire like you get it with what you go to the website and it's like it's an extension of me yeah. um at some point i was like maybe i start another brand and like cut yourself off from me but like i feel like part of the thing is about me a, a, a lot of these people I've known and built relationships with. So yeah. it's important. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's a great endeavor and I'm really looking forward to seeing what you do with it and where it goes. And I'm very much looking forward to the Nick book. I think I'm really going to keep my eye on that. I feel like I really want to buy it. 
So uh, I'm very, very interested in seeing how that turns out because it's going to be really, really good. Like, really good. You know, as I said, he's, he's, a, he's a real... Oh, his stuff's incredible. Blows my mind. Yeah. I mean, I have another, another man, uh, Derek Saville, who's in Dublin. Yes. Um, I'm working on his stuff as well. Um, and he actually gave me... He presented an entirely designed book. Oh, wow. Um, so I need to meet up with him. It's been a little while since we've chatted. But... Um, he's we need to just decide on paper stuff so that like hopefully there'll be two three books coming out in the last third of the year which is a bit hectic but it's fine uh, that's good though it's i bet it's nice for you to see like everything finally complete and done and it's out there and it's physical and you can actually hold it in your oh, hands. it's it's a, such a high it's crazy like I, mean, I, look, I mean i have a stack of my own books here that i've made over the years and hundreds of my other books that i've bought over the years when you could like i mean I actually got, I built some good relationships and got these first photo books now book into my favorite bookstore in Melbourne. Wow. Uh, they That's actually cool. won. They actually won World Bookstore of the Year a few years back. Wow. Um, and so, like, the, I built that right, right relationship, and I could go in there and see that book that I made on their shelves. It's cool. Wow. that's cool so that's really cool and i think actually yeah like the distribution of the box is it a case of you putting them into bookstores or is it a case of like to print on demand look what i've been what i've done generally is so the first the suburban book i did 30 copies or 50 copies i can't remember um the coastal book i did 70 copies um because i mean obviously when you're printing things the higher your volume the better the margins are of course um, um, and I was quite lucky that with the Coastal book, one of the contributors bought 20 copies. Wow. And I give everybody a copy who's involved. Um, but he bought more on top, like 25 or something copies on top. Fair enough. So that but that was like 80% of the cost of production, hmm. the actual just in costs. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's a very complicated well, not complicated. It's just like it takes money to produce them. So either you ask for the money or you just produce the money yourself. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. Because the thing with printing books especially is like there's a huge upfront cost, particularly if you're trying to sell them as well. Yeah. I mean, like, and then I sent, I, I actually have this package sitting here on my desk, which has been I, like one of the other contributors. Again, I give them all a copy, but he bought five or six more. Hmm. Um, I mailed it to him in Italy, and Italian addresses are a bit crazy for <laughs> me. And so, like, it came back to me. So I got to now. I got to send his books back again. Yeah, we send it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, like, that's the tyranny of distance. Is that where I'm here in Australia, um, and I like I really need a European or at least North American distributor because yeah, it's so crazy to get stuff from it, particularly with the currency fluctuations and what have you over the last yes. six or eight months. It's insane. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, trying to send anything outside of the country you're from is can be an absolute nightmare, especially when it comes to like making sure it's tracked, making sure it arrives, making sure that it's not damaged. Absolutely. Like, absolutely. I've had, I've had a couple of books go to the US and it's been completely destroyed. Um, and you just replace them. You can't argue. You just yeah. replace them. It's you know it's annoying for the person who's involved and it's annoying for me and like yeah yeah but you know you're still making you make you know again getting those images out of Instagram yeah. is awesome you know? yeah that's the thing I feel like the problem is that we rely a lot on social media to see images and I think with photographs especially there's nothing better than seeing your work in print there's nothing better yeah. there's absolutely nothing better. And I feel like we just don't get, I think photographers especially don't really get the opportunity to have their work printed enough unless somebody wants to buy a print. Because, you know, you're not really going to just print your own work necessarily for yourself. People don't necessarily do that. Yeah, I mean, I, do, I've, I have, I do that periodically. It depends on how, how much, what I'm, you know, how much money I have in my pocket. Um, hmm. I have an amazing company that prints my work in Melbourne. Um, I've used them for, 15 years um, but there's lots of other companies here as well and I know look I know great companies in the UK and also in the US because I have a good network um, but you know like that's unusual like you, I have A2 prints which have cost me 90 bucks to get printed 
Yeah. Um, and like they're archival, they will last for decades. I can give them to my children or I can you know, donate them to the high, my high school or something, but That's it's a lot of money, you know? So I think I think the biggest problem really actually with a lot of physical like whether it's books or prints is that it costs a lot of money. Like you have to really have the money to be able to do it. And I think the problem yeah. is that you know something like photography, especially in this economy, it doesn't really make a lot of money necessarily, depending on what you're doing. Yeah. I think that's particularly yeah. for like the fine art side where people want to have prints or they want to produce books. I think that's really yeah. going to make the issue. Yeah, I'm trying to still trying to find the right way to make make all these things work, and that's where some something like sounds like an economics discussion now but like i mean it's you know so, so like, i'm looking at stuff in i'm looking at printing in estonia or slovenia or china or uh, i'm mean, printing in the us or the uk is just not really an option really is definitely not an option um it's 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 a really complicated set of things um I think it's, it's a good thing to think about, though, because you have to think about the bottom line and you have to think about, like, and if you want to make this into, like, a profitable business and not just say, like, a lot of the things we do nowadays, particularly online, are very illusionary because it seems like it's a business, but it doesn't mean it is a business just because you're doing stuff. You know, it's like, I look at your photo books now and I'm like, you must be making money off that. But you're saying to me, maybe not really. And it's like, you will eventually, of course. I think you definitely will because you have to. It's not sustainable long term yeah. if you don't. But the fact that you're not surprises me. Like, absolutely, that, like, that's the thing. It's not just about, oh, you have a book here, buy it. It's like the amount of time and effort that's gone into the whole process of making a book. Because people don't see yeah. the process. They just see the end result. Very much like anything, like art like art and painting, people just see the end result. They don't see the time put into it. No, exactly, yeah. And painting yeah. is a great example. Is yeah. you know, Michelangelo worked on the Sistine Chapel for how long? I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, and even Van Gogh, you know, they all worked on... It's just stuff goes on forever. Um, yeah, cause, because that's the thing. So it's like, you know, when there's a book on the shelf and it's like 50 quid and people are like, oh, that's expensive. I think that's not expensive at all because you're paying for the time it took to create. Yeah. You know? And at the end of the day also, like 50 quid, you'll spend that on a game that you'll complete in two days. Yeah, there's a book that's going to be sitting on your bookshelf for the next decade you can always go back to. But, you know, yeah. or the, you, the money doesn't quite. You go to the pub and you lose 50, 50 quid in a few hours, right? I mean, <laughs> that's fine. I'll stop I stop buying books because I have a lot and I don't necessarily need any more. Yeah. Uh, I have, I went to my storage unit and pulled out like 15 books, which I'd kind of forgotten about. Wow. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I have the bedroom kind of behind me um, and there's bookshelves in there and like there's books that I've given to people and yeah. Um, and like I try not to have too many material possessions. I have a camera, a computer, and a couple of lenses, and those are the most important things. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Actually, let's get into your work because otherwise we're here talking about books for the rest there of the next three hours, which hey, would be a bad idea. So, can you describe your work for those who may not have seen it? Uh, I would go for it's very much observational. Um, when I first started making pictures, it was about being kind of abstract. Yeah. Um, but utilizing architecture as a bit of a basis. Um, so it's very geometrical. Um, it's very much about place as well. I mean, most of the things that I've worked on for a long time have all have been about, I mean, the first thing I'd go back to is my high street project, which I've worked on for 10 years, like almost wow. probably to the day. Some weeks I'm there every day making the pictures, other times it's like you don't get there for two months. Uh, but one stretch of street, which is about, I don't know, like eight, nine kilometers long maybe. Um, and so I've just kind of documented the evolution of that street. And it kind of went from a lot of post-war immigration, so lots of Italians and Greeks, as we have here in Australia, um, to like, I mean, one of the most high-end restaurants in the city was there. Um, so it's like this interesting sociological study of a place. Um, so an old Greek accountant becomes a hydrotherapy bar or whatever mm. it might be. Um, and like, so it's, it's really interesting kind of looking at one place and it's just seeing how it changes over the course of time. 
that sort of become that's the sort of central focus of what I do. And I've done that in now a bunch of different locations around Melbourne and then a couple of regional cities around outside of Melbourne. And then, you know, I've been to Sydney and Adelaide and Tokyo and New York and lots of other places wow. around the world. And so, like, just going back to the same place and seeing what the effect of passage of time has on a place is is, is, is an interesting thing, you know? Have you ever been to the UK and shot images? No, I'm not, which is very strange because, as I said, I think before we started recording, yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, so my grandmother is from Renfrewshire, in yeah. Scotland, um, and my grandfather was in a um, was a was a Kiwi, quite high up in the British in the Kiwi Navy. Um, so they met in London during the Blitz. Um, and then my parents, this was actually, oh, wow. That's my, that's my grandmother's house in Scotland. Wow. Uh, um, and that print is from April, 1932. That's so cool. So uh, it's nearly a hundred year old print. And I pulled it out oh. of my storage. Um, so that's it's like, insane. yeah, so, um, so that, um, so my great grandfather, I had to wank on being about what, but my great grandfather was one of the only people to get a Royal Cross in World War One and World War Two. Oh. Um, so in theory, he's one of the very few people to pull that off. And there's somewhere there's pictures of, I suppose, King George at hmm. that house because oh, wow. he came to Scotland just after the war and visited because of my grandfather with or great grandfather with these things. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like I have a, it's weird because my name is Andrew because I had a Scottish grandmother. Um, but I've never been there. I have very close friends that live there and work for in media and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Um, I was actually meant to go have a job in a, big advertising agency in Canary Wharf about oh, wow. 20 years ago, but I didn't have the capital at that time to go and be able to wear those London expenses, you know? Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> this is the thing, like London, especially like obviously London, England, I guess, generally, but London especially is extremely expensive. It's, it's obviously very yeah. touristy, but particularly somewhere like Canary Wharf, which is like a business part of London, it's going to be expensive, like for sure. And also, you're not so, actually allowed to take pictures in Canary Wharf, which I didn't know until I went ages ago. Yeah, yeah right. So one day I will definitely get there. I mean, I still have a friend who has a longboat in, in, on the Thames. Um, oh, that's decent. She sold, her, she sold her house here and bought a longboat there. Um, <laughs> wow. Houses house is very, over, a very oh. overpriced. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, like, I'm... If, I have this crazy connection to that place, but I've never been there. It's weird. If you're ever over, let me know. I'd love to meet you in person. It'd be absolutely wonderful. Oh, yeah, I definitely will. Um, I like, but having said that, I mean, having been educated to an extent in the US, my sister's in New York. Uh, my mom's actually over there right now. Um, I have lots of friends from university there. Um, Australia's just kind of where I landed, you know. Um, where were you born then? My I was born in Chicago. Um, oh, in the States. that's interesting. So why Australia? So, uh, well, my dad was in advertising, um, and he like he'd met my mom in the UK, and they went back to the US, and he was like, "I just want to go somewhere that's different. I have to get out of here." Um, and so he, they were just like, "My mom was from New Zealand, I think." The company he was one of those big companies he was working for in the late seventies were like you can go to Australia, um, so they went to Australia. Uh, lived in Sydney. Um, then my sister was born here. Then hmm. uh, yeah, I mean my immediate family was born in three countries. So oh. <laughs> that's insane. That's insane. Yeah. Just like. Because travel, cause I guess travel is also kind of like a key element to your work. Oh, very much so, yeah. Well, it's it's about place. I mean, sometimes it's going, for me, it's like going to a new suburb I've never been to, or Tokyo, or Berlin, or some state in the States I've never been to. But, yeah, 
And I think that's probably just ingrained in who I am. Yeah. Because of, you know, my dad's family's German, my brother, my mother's family's British. Like, you know, we have like everything just feels like it's from somewhere else all the time. I kind of, I kind of love it. Um, See, that's interesting. So I wonder if it's like there's like a sense of like displacement in your work because you're trying to figure out where you fit in because you fit into so many different places, but you also don't fit into any of them. That's very true. I mean, I remember going to Berlin 20 years ago and I was like, I got off the train. I've been in Paris, got off the train in, well, first Dusseldorf where my family came from and then Berlin. I was like, I'm home. Hmm. All these people look like my father's family. Uh, it also felt quite Midwestern from an American perspective because there's lots of Germans in that part of the world. Hmm. Uh, and I've also like, I mean, having been in Tokyo, I'm like, oh man, I love feeling like a complete foreigner where nobody yeah. looks like at all. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my dream location is to go to Iran and, yeah. and make pictures in Iran because, like, it's just it's that's an amazing place, you know. Um, or Morocco or what have you. Like, understanding and seeing the world is kind of what, for me, what making what making photographs is. You know? Yeah, but I like that. That's actually really true, though. When I say that, actually, that's actually really true because it's about. Is it just about exploring? It's about going somewhere different. It's about kind of putting yourself into a different environment and figuring out how you're going to react to it. I think also, you know, when I spent, we had, you're probably aware to an extent, but we had some of the most punitive lockdowns in the mm. world during COVID here, and so I don't know what the numbers were, but it was like definitely three, four, five months. Don't go with, don't go more than five kilometers from your house. Um, you cannot really socialize, um, so everything was on Zoom. Um, it sort of loosened up a little bit, but like I spent that time, we had a I had a salary replacement for my job, so I could stay home and get eighty percent of my salary. It was just dropped in by the government every fortnight or whatever. Um, so I just was like, all right, the morning I wake up, have breakfast, read for a while, go for a walk. And so I just took photographs constantly of photographs. And there were like, you know, visual studies of my boring middle suburban neighborhood. But it presents something. It presents perspective on the world. And like that's yeah. kind of where the photo books thing came from at the same time. I was like, I don't just want to make these photos over and over again. What's the different way to present them? And so finding that, finding a way to make that work was, was fun, you know. Um, and it's a, it's a big challenge because... You know, you have it have to have a design evolution and a yeah, it's it's fun. It's it's really entertaining. Like, so do you, like with your own work. I'm very curious about like how you balance the presentation of your own work because if you create photo books for other people, when you go and shoot new work, do you think about how you're going to present it before you shoot it, or do you think about it after? No, I have like I have a huge unlimited. Well, I have a big Dropbox account. Hmm. And basically, I have month, year and month archives. And I, anything I finish, I export as a high-res TIFF and then a low-res JPEG and like yes. upload them, kind of forget about them. And then I spend, sometimes I just spend an entire day going through an online archive and going, all right, that fits with that, that fits with that. This wow. is geographically somehow. Um, and then, like, you, you can download an entire folder and then go, all right, that's this. And then you throw it into an InDesign document. And, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a weird kind of process. But, like, I, like, I basically don't leave my house without a camera and haven't done it for the better part of 20 years. See, that's a good idea. That's actually a piece of advice someone gave me a long time ago. It was, like, don't leave. Don't, don't go outside without a camera because you're, that's all, yeah. you're always, you're always going to see something that you're going to want to photograph. Your phone doesn't count. Like um, yeah. a camera which has, I mean, I have, I have a, I mean, I have a couple, two, or three cameras, but like it has weight in my bag. And mm. like, there's a camera in my bag. Yeah. I'll use it, you know. Yeah. Like, I mean, what I do at the end of like the beginning of a lot of my work days is I go, I get, I take a tram, eight, seven or eight kilometers, um, and I'm like. In Melbourne, we've had a crazy population explosion. The government's been building a bunch of train lines. And so one of my walks from getting off the tram to my place of business is walking along a street which was dug up 
and I dropped six ish stories underground and I built in the process of building a underground rail line. Um, oh, that's cool. I've spent the better part of the last five, four, five, whatever years kind of just taking pictures of that. And then I take the photographs, bring them back, edit them, put them in the cloud. And at some point that will become something else. You know, that becomes an exhibition or a book or something. And I'm looking, it might not become anything, but yeah. it's a body of work of a place and a time. It's tied up. And in a couple of centuries, it's, it's, it's quite something. You know? Do you think that you can, do you think there's such a thing as taking too many images? Absolutely. And like right now, I take a lot less photographs than I've ever taken before. Hmm. Uh, um, Cause I remember like, when I lost a hard drive or two along the years, and like I didn't even know it was on there, was that important? <laughs> Does it matter? Probably not. Um, and the only thing that really was the only thing that's really important is when your mother or your ex wife asked you for pictures of your kids, yeah, they're an age. I have two kids, um, and like so, like if you don't have that stuff. You just want to get more careful about backing your work up and understanding how that works. Um, but like the beauty of digital technology is that you can figure out if you're really interested enough in photography, you can figure out how to make it work hmm. from ISO to aperture to all the different things. Like I learned to shoot on film when I was 16. And then eventually I got a digital camera, um, but I knew the numbers and the ratios and how it all worked. Um, that's really important. Like there's got to be technical nature to it, which is why when you go from having a phone to a real camera, that's when the, the real work begins. You know? Yeah, because it's not just a case of point and shoot. You don't just, unless, obviously unless you're on auto, it's not a case of point and shoot because as a photographer, and I think a lot of people don't realize you make a lot of decisions before you press the shutter. It's not just a case of you taking an image. It's looking at the, where the light is or, you know, what, what's going on, what might be, it's, it's foreseeing things coming in and out of the frame or, you know, there's, there's so many decisions. Um, you know, I think patience is one of those things that every single time I go out and take pictures, I forget that you need because like, oh, yeah. I yeah. always forget. I was because I was out yesterday when I saw this exhibition. I took my camera and I thought I'd wander around Tamworth for a few hours to take pictures. Um, mm -hmm. And it's like I forget, even though I've done it for a long time now. I've done it for at least a good decade. Like I forget how much patience you need as a photographer, because yeah. especially if you, especially if you're shooting images that you want to be empty without people in, especially in cities, yeah. it can be very hard because you have to be patient. You have to make sure people aren't getting in your frame. You have to make sure you're going at the right time of day. You're making. You have to make sure that you are, you know, you're being safe, especially. And actually, how do you make sure you're safe when you're out and about shooting? Actually, I don't know. I mean, I grew up in, having grown up in the US, uh, where there's like, when I went to where I went to university in Savannah, I was actually I had a gun put to my head for twenty bucks. Oh, uh, that's okay. <laughs> um, I was relatively recently assaulted by a very aggressive Irish dude. He just punched me in the face for no reason. Oh. That was the first 25 years of living in Melbourne where there was an issue. Hmm. Um, I, I don't feel like safety here is a thing, um, purely because there's a lower population density. Hmm. Definitely in the UK and 100% combination of population density and guns in the US. Yeah. Um, like, here is different. Um, Probably if you're not male, it might be more complicated. Hmm. Uh, for me, I like I'm six foot three. I weigh nearly two hundred pounds. I'm not a small guy. Yeah. Um, most people will not fuck with me. Yeah. Um, but I completely understand a lot of other people. If you're not my size or my general appearance, that like, yeah, there's stuff down here. I mean, as I said, I got assaulted, but you got to be, you just got to be switched on. Um, but I also yeah. like the really, I really like the empty spaces. Like mm. I love being in, like I lived in the inner city for years. Um, and I kind of love that, but I, I now I kind of love, like I love the suburbs. 
Um, The weird emptiness that you get, being able to wander around and see nothing. Um, There's something weirdly charming about it, you know? Yeah, I think it's because... uh, People like Todd Hedo, who's a major inspiration for me, or... Or Jeff Browse is another one. Like, there's so many people who've milked that for decades, and like, that's those are the books that I own. That's the stuff that I love making. You know? I think it's interesting because I feel like it's about like a particular kind of like I think because a lot of the the photographers and a lot of photographs that I'm very much drawn to are very much the things that I shoot, and I'm always kind of curious yeah. that like, do you think that particularly in terms of like um gentrified cities that are empty do you think that's overdone now do you think that there we need to find a way to create the same imagery i think you're probably right like i mean you can look at i mean having grown up in michigan states like you want to google detroit Hmm. whatever like the amount of photos that have been taken in detroit or williamsburg for that matter or probably parts of london would be the same definitely Hmm. parts of lots of other cities like yeah and this is why maybe i've started maybe i went back to doing some graphic design stuff Uh, Hmm. you know there's like i mean i love taking i love doing portraits as well so it's like i did some portraits for some politicians and some like a theater group and you know like that's another way of just making pictures um it's another extension of creativity um Understanding light in a completely different way of working is it's it's really interesting. Um, and you think of yeah, portraits are an incredible thing. Like they take a take a, take. I have I take a portrait of my friend Dan, who's in my suburban book. Like we assisted each other on stuff over the years. Hmm. And like you know, we we get fatter, we get thinner, we get less hair, we get like gray hair, we get like and like that process of documenting people and. And places over time is really interesting. Yeah, because I think a lot of photographers I know who are really, really, really awesome photographers have never shot portraits. Yeah. And it's interesting I mean, for me. I've only done it in the last six years. And I'm, you know, 45. So, like... So I feel like people find it very daunting because it's because there's more uncontrollable variables because, obviously, with people who might change their mind, they might not be interested, they might be having a bad day, they might not like the yeah. work. Whereas, in, like, if you take a picture of a city street, it's not going to say no. No, exactly. I mean, I've taken photos of people, um, and they look. Eventually, they've, they've they've gone. All right, cool. We're good. We'll sign off on it. But I've gone back to look at them a year later or five years later, and I'm, I can't do anything with that. Mm. If they're happy, fine. But I can't like my vision and also the technology I use and my, the way that I shoot. Where they edit has changed so dramatically since then that I can't do anything with it. Um, so urban environments and city streets are kind of like a large focus of your work. So what is it about the city specifically that inspires you? Um, I think I lived in very boring American suburbia for a long time um, hmm. and felt very far away from Chicago and New York or and going, oh, and my mom, who I was staying with, obviously was living in the, in what was New York's first suburb outside of the city. And so I was like, well, so I hadn't been to Europe at that point. Being in New York or lots of other places were a bit of a distant memory. And I was just like, well, this is a good-sized city. Hmm. It was, what, maybe 3 million people, but now it's 6 million people. So that watching a place evolve over the course of time is really interesting. Population, demographics, um, architecture, all the different things. Like I think my, you know, my father and like lots of people in my sort of genetic history are been architects um, and engineers and what have you. And I feel like I, the first thing I ever did work-wise was do a an a internship in an architecture firm when I was in uh-huh. Michigan. Um, for it might have been a week, it might have been even less than that. Um, and the built environment is a really big concern for me. Um, you can't really put a finger on it why it's genetics to an extent, but um, it's just it's fascinating. Um, and we went Melbourne here went from zero apartments in the city about 35 years ago 
to a population of 75,000 people or plus in a pretty small uh-huh. area. Um, so, like, watching that happen is, is interesting, you know? Yeah, because I think one thing that I've always that I always really hated until actually probably the last few years is the idea of, like, cities rebuilding themselves. Like, here where I live, the university has become such a popular university that obviously they've rearranged the whole city just for the university, which is kind of yeah, interesting right. to see. Like, it's, it's horrible in one way because the buildings are hideous, but another, another side is actually really nice because the city's completely changed now, how it was, say, like, five, six years ago. And it's, yeah. it's interesting, and it's kind of interesting to see that happen, to see kind of the growth and the change of a city in a place that you know very well, kind of, because it changes your memories of the place as well. Oh, completely. Like, when I go to, like, there's a neighbourhood I've been hanging out in, in Melbourne called Fitzroy, um, and I go there now, I don't even recognise it. Hmm. Um, I have friends who've left um, 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, whatever. And like, I was taking a photograph of the store they used to work in. <laughs> and it used to be, you know, like a kind of ridiculous, very much of their time, raver store. And now it's the like a fucking whole grain place. It's yeah. like 90,000 <laughs> volts of quinoa, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, like, that kind of. But that can also run across Berlin, Tokyo, New York, London. Like it doesn't really matter. Like there's something really universal about the the way that our city and our world is changing. And I can't always put my finger on it, but that's kind of what I'm looking at with my own ph- photography. That's what I'm looking at really capturing. You know? it, and I say that's kind of interesting because it makes me think about like economical changes and the way in which they're like a place might be um, really rich and then suddenly like it's really poor and then how do the shops and the surroundings change because of it particularly when like shops close down for instance and, and stuff like that actually and those are that i'm gonna i feel like i need to document my city a lot more um and that's interesting actually no because like, now i'm thinking about it, it's interesting because where i live is it now you said that i'm thinking about it now like where i live is it's definitely going through a huge change at the minute in terms of like a lot of places are being knocked down and a lot of places are empty and it's kind of yeah. interesting to think about that in terms of like well what comes next yeah. Because, you know, because like, why is a city without a city centre? You know? When you end up with a place like Detroit, as an example for me, I hmm. spent a bit of time there as a teenager, um, and you went from producing, and lots of Amer- like lots of British cities are the same, steel yeah. towns yeah. up north, uh, where they went from producing most of the world's steel to doing nothing. I think Sheffield is yeah. probably a really good example. Maybe Birmingham, Birmingham um, yeah. probably Manchester as well. Um, but like, die. This is like the Rust Belt in the States. The UK does very much the same thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because the city I'm from, Coventry, it used to be uh, really big for Jaguar Land Rover and production of cars. Oh, of course, yeah. Whereas now it's not. Or it is, but not in the same way. Definitely not at all in the same way. So it used to yeah. be very industrial, like, say, like 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, whereas and now it's kind of almost becoming a ghost town at this point, I guess, more than anything right now. Yeah. Yeah. Probably, I mean, I can imagine that from being in Detroit, where they used to make all those cars, and now they make really nothing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If, if Jaguars are made in Taiwan or Korea exactly. or somewhere. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's the same thing. I mean, in, in Melbourne, we, in Australia, we don't actually even make cars anymore because wow. Holden, who is the original car company in Australia, has been retired by GM because they bought it 20, 30 years ago, whatever. Uh, Ford doesn't produce cars in Australia anymore, which they've done for 60, 70 years. Um, we don't have manufacturing here like the UK, you know? Oh, that's um, interesting. So that's yeah. interesting because I'm always I'm always really fascinated by and I was talking about this the day uh, industrial estates. I think industrial estates are really fascinating because like oh, yeah. these like these like small buildings or like they're always on like the outskirts of towns that actually probably run cities, but like they're yeah. they're what they're creating is is kind of like integral to the city itself. But they're never actually within the city. They're always on you know some kind of weird outskirt. There's something about that I really like. Yeah, they're five or ten miles out of the city. Yeah, there's something um, about that I really like. That kind of interesting parallel the fact that yeah. what's running the city is something that you don't see yeah like it's about like, that I mean, really interest me well it's like i mean if you think about a place like i don't know think about being in piccadilly or mayfair or somewhere in london hmm. 
Um, and then like most of the people who run those hotels and bars and pubs and whatever, they're going to live out in the sticks somewhere. They're going to get on the yeah. tube, they're going to come in, they're going to do the job and then go home again. Uh, yeah. And the people who make the decisions, they're the people who can afford to live in Mayfair or what have you. And then yeah. that's it's a, the, the combination of economic perversity, I guess is a good word for it, yeah. um, really creates things. And New York is the same. And I imagine Japan and certainly China would be the same. Um, but, yeah, it's like – and that's what photography is for me is sociological. Hmm. You know? Looking yeah. at the way the world is around us and going, how, well, why? What is this? Yeah. I mean, I have to make any conclusions, but it's still, it's there, and you can at least go, this is what I see. Other people can make those conclusions about it. You know? So, what can we learn about ourselves from looking at images of the environment? Well, that's a good, yeah, that's, I love that. Um, well, we can definitely learn what we were. Going back to being in Melbourne again, because that's mainly what I know these days. Um, and so Melbourne has the biggest collection of Victorian architecture in the world. Oh, wow. Because London and most of the UK was destroyed during the war, whereas yeah, we were not. Um, Sydney's the same, because Melbourne and Sydney are older again than the rest of the country. Um, but we're definitely, it's an opportunity to look backwards. Um, and see what we used to be. Whereas when you go to, having been to Berlin, nobody wants to look backwards because that, that yeah. shit was fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> um, and like, I, mean, I remember, like, I haven't been there in 20 years, but I remember seeing what used to be the Stasi headquarters hmm. in central Berlin had been literally wrapped around and ignored. Hmm. Since the fall of the wall in 89, it was more than 20. It was about 20 odd years since I've been there in between. They just box it up and forgot about it. Now it doesn't exist anymore. Hmm. Uh, whereas we here were able to look at the history, at least our colonial history, in hmm. a better way. And so we can, yeah, we were able to process what we've done. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's quite right, but yeah. We have yeah. a we have something we have something pretty special here, which a lot of the rest of the world doesn't have. Um, I mean, like going back to my dad with the advertising agencies in the eighties, like he had offices in St Kilda Road, which is one of the big roads out of the city. Now it's entirely skyscrapers, um, and the big companies were able to change. The postcode with the government to include one road coming out of the city to have the city postcode of 3000. Wow. Um, so my dad had offices on this road in the 80s as an advertising director or an advertising company owner, but now none of those old houses, which are kind of like post gold rush, they don't exist. Wow. Yeah. It's a six six or seven kilometer stretch of road which is now just full of glass towers which is fine because it's 21st century but we lost all this architectural heritage <laughs> yeah so that's actually a good point the idea of like that's actually not something i've thought about which sounds silly but like the idea of like history and how actually photographs act as like a time capsule in terms of oh, like really? like yeah. you can pull images from your archive from you know like 20 years ago and the world would be an yeah. incredibly different place yeah, I mean, I have, there's a photograph I have, um, and I have it printed huge, like 24 by 36 inches huge. Wow. Uh, it's in my storage unit. I took it from the Fensterturm in Berlin, in the center, center of Berlin, um, and it is almost exactly 20 years old because I was there in, like, October, October 2003. Uh, but, like, the photograph that I took was of old – communist block apartment buildings um, they built all the stuff up close um, to sort of push their ideas of of their you know the ultimate society on the democratic governments on the other side 
um, which Anna Funda writes about in her book, Stasi Land, which is about 20 years old as well. But like, I don't know, you can use all the stuff on lots of sociological and political kind of levels, if that makes sense. Hmm. The way that, the way that you make pictures really like I mean I can document what I'm what's happening in this city right now, and it'll play into politics and all sorts of other stuff. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. I think the interesting thing is is that we forget actually how alike cities are, even though they're very different. Yeah. Oh, completely. Like, um, and I think Australia and the UK, there's very much a tie-in because of those things, because yeah. obviously there's colonial history and all the rest of yeah. it. Um, Australians might like to complain about the UK, but they still voted for a to remain a part of the ref to remain a part of the uh, empire twenty odd years ago, and that's mm. never changed again. Um, mm. Yeah, because it's, it's interesting how like past history and politics especially always feed into the way the city itself changes and develops and then obviously that will impact you and your work because you're documenting that and like do you consider your work to be documentary oh yeah i've always look at something i think about on a very regular basis i'm like i don't really know if i'm an artist or not Hmm. i mean sure i'm making things Hmm. but am am i a craftsman or a Am I a craftsman or am I a, yeah, is, uh, or am I a documentarian? It's a good question. Um, and maybe sometimes I make art, sometimes I don't, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, because yeah, I'm always interested, because I've always felt, just for as an observation as somebody who looks at a lot of, of art and a lot of photography, is that I feel like, yeah. particularly when it comes to like American photography and British photography, I feel like Amer- a lot of American photographers I know like to have narrative work. But a lot of British yeah. folk I know like to have kind of observation and documentary work. I think it's yeah. the idea. I've always been kind of curious, like, like how do you take an image that both tells a story and is also a, like a documentarian or documentary type, type image? Because it's like, I don't know, like narrative, like narrative photography, especially, is a huge kind of buzzword. The idea of something being cinematic, especially for instance, is it kind of like yeah. quite trendy? But also at the same yeah. time, like, there's a reason for it being trendy, or like there's a reason that people are drawn to that kind of imagery. It's like for you and your work, especially because you know there are times where you shoot say like at night, for instance. Like, how do you make sure that your work isn't just like quote unquote trendy, or it's not just kind of appealing to the masses? Well, I why are there people in your pictures? Well, I'm mm. like, I don't want to take people pictures. Um, now I make portraits, and I love making portraits. Yeah. Um, but like, I don't want to. Sometimes, like, you can have lots of, like, there's lots of musicians who've made, I don't know, this is going to make me sound like a bit of a jackass, but, like, Dave Grohl. So Mm. he was in Nirvana. He was in the Foo Fighters. He was also in Probot, which is, like, a thrash metal thing. Mm. Like, he just loves music. And if you want to watch something like his, there's a documentary he made a bunch of years back called Sound City which was like made about one studio in LA where it's like, it's been around for like 60 years. And he's like Nirvana made a record there and Foo Fighters made a record there, but so did like Blondie and Fleetwood Mac and like a whole bunch of really random people made albums there. So it's like, just because you're doing this thing, like there's lots of different forms inside of that thing, which can, you can explore. Yeah. If it's, I mean, look, I've I've got a collection of like four beer cans on my front thing over there. Cause yeah. It's like I want to learn how to make still life photographs. Yeah. I like beer. Um, I have a bunch of lights and some flashes and things. I'm gonna like we're gonna do some like learning and make some photos of the beer cans. Yeah. Um, and like you know, eight nine years ago, I was like I want to make photos of people just because I haven't done that before. Yeah. So it's just explore something. You know? It's about challenging yourself, um, doing something different. Yeah. Um, look, I can go out there and, like, I mean, a bunch of years ago, I remember having, I wrote this in that email that I responded to, but I, I remember, like, as if a friend that I was, you know, we'd regularly have coffee, we'd drop our kids off to, to after, at school drop off, we'd go and have coffee. Um, 
one day I had nothing on after the coffee. I was like, all right, I'll just keep on going. So I spent like seven hours walking and photographing things. Hmm. I got home, edited all the photos, kind of batch processed them in Lightroom. And within two hours of that, I literally had ordered a photo book, which I'd made. Wow. So I, des- I produced, designed, and then executed the photo book in 15 hours, maybe wow. less. And I have that sitting in my, it's somewhere around here. I don't know where it is. Um, wow. That's but it's cool. like, yeah, being a little bit, like you can't be too precious about stuff. you gotta got to yeah. like mess around, experiment. Yeah. And like, that was probably 10 years ago. I should probably do that again. Um, yeah. But like just coming up with stuff and doing it, not being too precious about ideas and enjoying enjoying what's going on. See, that's really funny because I've spent this year so far going to a different place every month to shoot images and I've got no idea yeah. what I'm doing with them yet. This is the problem. They're all sitting on my hard drive waiting to be edited. If you can come back to them in six months or 12 months or whatever, you yeah. can make something. Yeah, because my, my plan is to make a photo book um, or my plan is to give myself some projects that I can work on because otherwise yeah. I'll just shoot images aimlessly forever, which is cool, but yeah. I'm also like, I want a project. So it's like, I've got a few projects in mind. It's just, I like the idea. And actually, I like the idea of long-term projects. This is what I like. Yeah. Because I think we live in a society that expects you to put stuff out every single day or always be creating new work or always be doing something. And I feel like yeah. sometimes that doesn't give you the the um, ability to be able to assess what you're doing. No, absolutely. Like, you're going to get a bit of space from what you're making. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I like, I'm really bad with passion passwords and all sorts of stuff like that um about uh it was probably beginning of the year kind of end of the last year beginning of this year i lost access to my original instagram account didn't have massive amounts but it was like hmm. two two and a half thousand followers yeah. gone the the email address which i created to like to create the account was gone it hmm. doesn't exist like so like i was like that doesn't really matter Whatever it is, it doesn't actually matter. I have all those, well, a good chunk of those images backed up somewhere. Yeah. Um, and I just, you do something else. Like sometimes you go to Walmart and you just print out 200 images at 10 cents each and it's 20 bucks. And you're like, cool, I got it. It's fine. It's all that really matters. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's probably why, well, probably why I need another storage unit because um, I am yeah. slightly obsessed making prints of things um but like getting stuff off that screen i'm tired yeah. of my phone runs yeah. my life like probably most of us yeah uh, yeah um, but it's, it's also how i run the businesses and how i make things yeah. kind of happen, you know yeah like it yeah it's kind of it's hard because you have to have a balance of like you want to see your work in front of you physically but it's also like to be able to do that you need to be on your phone to make the money to do that until recently i've had a full-time other job outside of photography mm. uh, and it's like it's it's gonna kill me it's cost me probably a whole lot um but like you know i'm begin. i've explored things i mean i've been making the last six months i've been working for a guy and we do demolition so i've been making time lapses of demolition wow um, that's so cool so, yeah like it's small scale stuff but like that's cool though that's really cool yeah and also, uh, if, it's in, if it's in nicely with just kind of the overall themes of your work generally about kind of like the changing cities and just the idea of documentation, yeah, yeah. it's kind of nice. Even right. if it isn't necessarily planned, it's kind of nice. It's still in your interest. Yeah. And like I just saw an ad in a kind of cool creative group that I'm a part of here in Melbourne and people I know run it. And now, like, I mean, I work for him. He's actually, you know, getting ready to possibly start a business with him. Uh, so it's like the way this stuff works is really unknown but like i was very much locked into one place at one time yeah um and during covid i was able to just kind of break out of all that stuff and go right what's important that's a good question to ask yourself what's important i feel like we don't really often get the time to ask ourselves what's important we don't get the time to chase what's important and covid we i i got that opportunity and lots of people did whatever you whatever they did with that is another question i know what i had to do that's yeah. very true. That's very true. I think COVID, particularly for artists, obviously obviously it wasn't always the best time for a lot of people, but I think for, for quite a lot of people I know especially, COVID was a very useful time 
for the amount of time they were given to be able to focus on one thing? I mean, well, like Australia was quite lucky. I don't know. I don't know so much about the UK, but we were able to. Um, you know, my salary was entirely paid. Um, yeah. For I don't don't know however long it was, but it was paid for a good chunk of time. Hmm. Um, so I was able to like either go to work or not, and so I spent a huge amount of time just looking at stuff and thinking about things and. Uh, so I'm trying to just that that's one of my paintings that I made oh, wow. many years ago. Well so actually what kind of painting did you do? So what was your subject matter? Uh it was very it was basically my photographs. So that's interesting to me because I feel like people always go the opposite way. People go from people often paint from photographs. So it's interesting that you went from painting to photographs. Yeah. Well I realized that like as a, a thing I mentioned earlier on about like going to going to Europe and coming back putting the prints of things on a wall and then immediately selling them. I was like, wow, that's kind of crazy. Having go- and again, going back to Paul Coley from Saatchi and Saatchi, uh, like that thing of photography was always in the back of my mind. Like I'd had a camera since I was 14. Hmm. I took it away when I was 25. So I had a camera for 11 years. Um, and I still have the camera. The film door is broken and it's kind of screwed and it's from 86. So it just doesn't work. But, I have it because it reminds me of something. And so, I don't know, like, you just got to be open to stuff. Maybe I'll start painting again one day when I get my little property in the country and I have time to sit around and twiddle my thumbs, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, though, because <laughs> painting and photography take very different kind of times. Yeah. 125th of a second versus four and a half weeks. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, absolutely, that's the thing, because it's kind of like, photography might seem a lot more instant, but I also feel like, there's actually a lot more that goes into it behind the scenes as opposed to just like the actual image you see. Because I think with painting, we know that there's a process. With photography, we don't think about that process. Yeah, but you need to like, I mean, I can go out there with, like, I could look outside right now and look at my street and go, all right, it's two street lights. There's no moon. I can figure out some basic exposure stuff. Yeah. And I can put, a, put my camera on a, on a tripod and, but it's going to be a bunch of messing around to get just the right exposure. And then I'm going to have to like bring it back in and Photoshop it or Lightroom it or whatever. And like, then you got to like spend two hours going, eh, that's not so good. And go back and reshoot it again. And you know, like people, like it's much harder than you think. Mm. Um, I remember being slightly resentful of people in like, particularly in high school, who come into our art class and go, I'm just going to take pictures. I'm like, but you don't understand what pictures are because you haven't made a painting mm. <laughs> or you haven't made a sculpture. Like I used to do clay and, you know, all, all sorts of all sorts of stuff. And I was like, people just didn't, like people just come and just like, oh, I just make photographs, which is fine. Can't argue with that. But, like, I mean, I've looked at many, many different aspects of visual culture over the, my decades of life. And I've done life drawing and I've done pottery and I've done still life photography and portrait photography and I've, ban- I've shot bands and I've like designed books and like it's just it's a it's a world. You know? Do you think that anyone could be a photographer though? Yes, but can you make an interesting photograph? That's the real question. I don't really know if I do, but what I will say, somebody I used to work with in my long-standing hospitality job. She, we lived in, we live in similar neighborhoods. I actually worked in similar neighborhoods, but she didn't have any art background or what have you. She's like, oh, I happened upon one of your photographs of whatever area it was. She's like, I suddenly got it. And she saw that place in a slightly different way. Because of the way that I'd chosen the light and the cropping and all the other bits and pieces. Um, and like, I, it was a bunch of years ago, I had a friend who was a teacher um, and I took, took cameras. I wouldn't have, they had cameras. We took the cameras into the classroom, gave yeah, them 15 minutes in a, in a playground. And all they did was take photographs of each other, which is what, you know, nine year olds do. Hmm. And I gave them a, 10 minute maybe uh, historical study 
of 20th century photography from Man Ray to, yeah, like just looking at lots of different styles of photography. And then again, we sent them back out for 20 minutes and the stuff they came up with between not, having any exposure to that art history to post exposure to art history was fascinating. Mm. Like, like, I mean, it's all about how you're educated. Um, yeah. What you see, what you look at, if you're exposed to books, if you, you know, like I take my kids to the gallery because that's important. You know, mm. they can go see a Titian or a Rembrandt or whatever it might be. Like nobody should be, denied that because we all have we have that ability to see these things uh, and learn about visual culture do you think there's a difference between an image taker and an image maker yeah look i've look i i get that mm -hmm. i don't know if i really understand that though yeah okay um because i mean i've look I've, I've spent thousands of hours walking around the streets in lots of cities and lots of countries um, but I've also spent lots of time in studios and made photographs of portraits of people and controlled the light. And yeah. it's just a different process. Yeah. Um, it's like, I'm trying to come up with it. Yeah, it's like, there is a difference. I couldn't probably put my finger on it, but it's, there's definitely a difference somehow. Um, I guess it's like maybe like going to a, Burger joint versus going to a fine dining restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. That's that. You know, you, 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 you go get a curry in your local curry place or you can go to Fat Duck and spend 1,900 pounds, whatever it might be. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like, and like, it's the same basic theory, but it all works a little bit differently. Yeah. The end result is the same. You get the same thing at the end of it. You're, you're still going to have food in your stomach. Yeah. You're still going to have an image in front of you. Yeah. But, yeah, it's not a great idea, but maybe you see where I'm going with it, you know? So what is your creative process like in terms of, like, do you have any particular routines that help you focus on creating? Um, I mean, I spend a huge amount of time listening to music. I've spent a lot of time just being in the world. But um, usually I just have a camera and I'm just shooting stuff. Um, but in the last year or two or three, I've started um, – kind of drawing again but it's kind of design based drawing mm. um but i mean music film and environment are kind of the three things like, i love i love those things and that's kind of what i do and because of most of my photos are very much um place-based it's not going out i mean there's been times where i've gone around i'm gonna go to a place i've never been to before so i get in a train line and just disappear uh, and go to out of town or a suburb i've never been to before and just see what happens. Um, Is being spontaneous important to you, though? Yes, but I also like the ability to curate stuff, mm. which is where the book stuff comes from, I think. It's like, all right, so I, let's take 300 images and turn that into 60 really polished things, mm. um, which kind of work together as a whole. Yeah, I mean, spontaneity is amazing. I mean, sometimes when you're shooting portraits, you can sit there and shoot. 300 frames in four minutes but sometimes when i've gone out for walks and shot 12 frames in three hours hmm. so it's like it's all about it depends on how you're controlling the situation like if if i'm in a studio and i can change the light cool i can change the light and make it work this way instead of that whereas if i'm outside it's just like literally documenting what's going on around me yeah yeah. Um, and it's funny because earlier today I got up and it was quite dark. I thought I haven't been out and taken photographs in the night at, at night time for a long time. I'm half considering after we finish off just taking a camera and a tripod and going out in the dark, doing some long exposure stuff, um, just seeing what happens. So it's finished to say that because uh, I was thinking the same thing. I was like, actually, I might go out a bit after this, actually, because I'm kind of very inspired to do so right now. <laughs> right. I might do the same to be fair. Yeah, just as I said, like I take my camera with me 90% of the time. Um, and you got to be ready for stuff. Mm. Um, I've spent a lot of my working life as a very much like I've had to be really social 
So I'm pretty antisocial. I have a bunch of friends who I see on a semi-regular basis. Like sometimes I'm like, I don't want to I, I go out in the world. I just like I put my earbuds in and I'm like, I've got the music going and that's the thing. So like when I take folk, when I'm making portraits of people, it's very much a plan. Like I'm going to take this person at this time and do these things. Um, yeah, like I, I love being we as 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 I mentioned earlier, like we had the longest lockdowns in the world, mm. and I loved it. Mm. People here look at me like I'm insane, but I'm like I completely adored it because I came up with so much stuff, which is where photo books now came from, and it just made me re rationalize everything. I think also that's a good point because I think photography, for the most part, is quite a solo pursuit. Like you're mostly yeah. outside by yourself taking images kind of not being hopefully bothered by other people yeah and the number of times i've been done why are you taking a photo of that because people just don't get it yeah oh yeah absolutely absolutely particularly if you're standing somewhere like very busy or somewhere that is um yeah, yeah that's just kind of popular or well, not popular but just kind of populated yeah i accidentally like there was a relatively seedy part of melbourne and like this is probably 15 years ago, but I remember, I remember accidentally taking a photo of a guy buying a porno from across the street. And he like yelled at me and flipped me off. And I think I got a photo of him flipping me off. But I was like, it wasn't the plan. It just happened. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, now that, that store, I'm, I don't go into that part of town much, but I'm 90% sure that store has been redeveloped mm. because the station was kind of banded. So it just doesn't exist anymore. That's actually really interesting because we forget that things will change i don't have any tattoos but i contemplate if there was a tattoo i'd get yeah it would be things would change <laughs> i've lived in three countries in like six cities like i've got two i've got two kids from two, two different relationships like mm -hmm. everything always changes we forget yeah. that i think i think that's the thing i think we always forget in our lives currently that things will change you think you always feel like well, at least i've always felt like where I am now is where I'll always be, but that's actually not yeah. the case at all. That's really yeah. not the case. I'm going to have the same day job as I had for basically 10 years, but mm. all the rest of my life is changing dramatically around that. It's the only thing which is really the same, apart from human life, mm. 10 years ago. Um, and I'm able to, I've been able to build a whole bunch of other stuff around that, like photo books now and you know other bits and pieces. And... But that's the only thing that's the same, and I kind of love it. Um, Is there an image that you regret not taking? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I did go and egg an egg. I did go and egg a KKK rally when I was in Michigan when I was in mm -hmm. high school. It would have been great to photograph then, because fuck those people. Mm. <laughs> mm. Um, and I do feel like I missed out on a lot of stuff in Georgia in the states. Uh, because I mean, we're going. I was going to university in a pretty poor town in Savannah, um, and you know we were all paying crazy amount of money to go to university. Um, and look, I, I was mugged at gunpoint. Somebody put my put a gun to my head for twenty bucks, um, and like not documenting those parts of my life, I kind of regret. But is what it is, you know. Like, yeah, because I always felt like with photographers, there's because obviously, for the most part, people kind of go out and plan what they're going to shoot, or they're spontaneous. But there's always something that happens that you look back and you're like, I wish I'd taken that picture. There's always something yeah. that people, there's always something that people regret not taking, and it's kind of interesting to ask I photographers. Being, I remember being in Washington in 2009. Uh, my now ex-wife is doing a PhD uh, research. And I remember like seeing, uh, what was it? Not, not Jack. It was a Kennedy that died around that time. Mm. Ted, yeah, Ted, Ted Kennedy died. And there was an entire um, military cavalcade going down one of those big ave avenues in, in Washington at that time. And for some reason, I took thousands of photographs on that trip, but I didn't photograph that. I don't really know why. Um, that would have been kind of cool because that was definitely like a part of history. Hmm. Uh, and now 
JFK's daughter is in the, is the American ambassador to Australia. And so she's quite a, she's often on the news. So like there's kind of that connection, that link back to that stuff, you know? So, hmm. Cause it's interesting. Cause it's about a lot of the time it's about memory as well, in terms of like, you remember things because you photograph them or you remember them because you're there at that moment in time. Yeah. I don't remember being a kid, but I remember the photographs that I have and I've scanned and backed up Yeah, because, I just remember those. They've always been there. They've been there for forty plus years. Um, like that's yeah. interesting. Like yeah. that's interesting, actually. My memory is horrendous. It's always been horrendous. Um, and like photos are probably why I try and that's how I remember stuff. Hmm. I was going to say there's probably a link there then, if that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I can remember the weirdest facts, but don't remember the most <laughs> obvious things. <laughs> So you shoot digital now, don't you? Yeah, I've shot digital almost exclusively since like 2009. Yeah, I was in New York in 2009 and shot quite a bit of film, and I have that still. And I'm, but I don't know, like some point after that, my film door broke and my camera was from 1986, and I'm just like, Meh. I can make amazing black and white photographs from. Kind of like I start off, if I want to make black and white stuff, I start off with a Lightroom preset and then kind of go from there. Um, I did a lot of black and white digital for a while because I was given a printer. I was like, I don't know how to print color. I'll just make black and white. Cool. Um, and I still have that printer, but it's, but um, yeah, it made me want to print things. But yeah, like totally digital. Like I have a full frame Nikon and have a mirrorless as well. And you know, like they make cool things, you know, the, the, the ability to minimally, minimally manipulate pixels um, and make cool prints is really satisfying. Um, How important is gear though? Yeah. I mean, you know, I try and replace a camera every two years or three years. Um, but I also, I'm quite lucky. I have a friend who earns a huge amount of a lot more money than I do. He buys a lot of camera gear, and I kind of just buy his pass-offs. Um, so my mirrorless I got for, I don't know, half price. Hmm. Um, I've got a bunch of lenses that are from him. Um, I mean, it's interesting because for a long time, gear was never an important thing. Um, hmm. But now that we rely on megapixels, it is important. Like, hmm. the, the prints that I can get out of my Z6 are nuts. Um, and like the quality and the matching those colors between the screen and the rest of it is, is incredible. Hmm. Um, but having said that, I can print a photograph, I can print some Ilford film from 2002, scan it up to the right degree, and it still will do the same thing. Um, yeah. I just choose to use digital stuff because the last time I got film developed, it cost me like. 50 bucks to get scans and all the rest of it. And I can't be bothered doing it myself. Like, what are your thoughts on the whole kind of like film versus digital photography debate? You know, our film is better because it's like traditional. What are your opinions on that? As somebody who's used both? I kind of, I get it. Like, I, I see a quality in film. Um, as I said, looking at, mentioning some of the photos I've taken in Berlin or Paris, mm. particularly, particularly black and white film, I think does amazing things. I feel that, I haven't deliberately made a black and white picture digitally for a long time. I suppose because I don't find it as satisfying as I might have found color or sorry, as I, as I find color stuff. So like if I want to make a black and white picture, I'd probably just borrow a black and white or borrow a film camera and buy some film. Hmm. 99% of the photographs that I make now are, are color. Um, does that make sense? Like, that does make sense because black and white is something I've just never shot. I just don't shoot black and white images. I just, it's just something I'm very, I'm not afraid to do necessarily, but I'm also like, I just don't have, I should, I should probably do. It's a challenge I should give myself, but it's also something that I'm very like, I would love to get a film camera and shoot black and white film. I've got a friend who said to me, you should get a film camera because I've, I've never really shot film. At least I did when I was at university, but I haven't done it since. How old are you? 30. So you're, yeah, you're 15 years younger than I am. Yeah. Um, the first photography classes I took was in 1993. When I was born. Or maybe 94-ish. <laughs> uh, I took a 
So like that's like that was the only option. Yeah. I mean, the first digital photography I did was in this goes to show where I came from in the US, but we had a Mac with Photoshop okay. in our art class. Wow. In um so we had a I suppose it was an Apple camera. I looked it up recently, I can't remember now, but we had an Apple digital camera in ninety three or four. Wow. And I would go in and we had Photoshop one or two or something. Um and we I would go into Photoshop and be changing individual pixels because I was like That's this insane. is kinda cool. Um and then by the time I got to university in like ninety six or so it was you know things that exponentially exist. so like I've always kind of messed around with digital stuff. Um and like I mean I grew up going to like I didn't grow up, but I would like I got my taste of um techno and house culture in the Midwest and the US. So stuff was, you know, like, you know, I got I went to university and our beginnings of like went from home to the university and we had a computer lab in my dorm in an art school. Hmm. So it's like, you know, like it was it was very much always about looking forward and looking at technology and seeing what was the best technology you could possibly get, which is what's interesting about AI right now, you know? Yeah. But I know some amazing, incredible photographers are doing really cool stuff with AI. I don't know how to make it work yet, because I'm hmm. still trying to figure out how to make a camera work. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I think you're doing, I mean, pretty, I think you're doing a pretty good I, job of that so far, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> I looked at, like, I opened up, I think Illustrator in the last couple of weeks and gave it a verbal command. I was like, yeah, that's not bad. It took three or four minutes to, you know, extrapolate the ideas. And I was like, yeah, I like being able to like use my Wacom tablet or my camera. Yeah. And like, but it's like, again, yeah, you know, people were suspicious of digital technology and eventually that's all we use. So it'll, it'll sure. find a way to, I've found Jet, Jet GPT is kind of incredible. Or see, you know, that is amazing for writing proposals. Hmm. Uh, like I write stuff down and then I can forget about it, come back to it and edit that, which the chat thing has come up with. Like hmm. We're in such early stages of it that we don't really understand it. It's the best yeah. way to put it. In terms of technology, in general, to the way we do everything, Right now, we're just beginning to work it out. So, yeah. So, what are your thoughts on photographers that take digital images but edit them to look like film images? Yeah, I mean, I get the, you know, as somebody who's had a full time job for many years and decided to be like, yeah, let's just be poor instead. <laughs> um, I get the, um, I get the, follow your passions. Don't do much of the stuff you don't really care about. Um, I get that. How convincing that actually is is another question. I yeah. don't know. You know, um, I remember being really annoyed when Instagram first came out. Um, first of all, you couldn't plug in a real photograph; you had to use your phone. Secondarily, it was like you had to use what five different presets. So I was like, these hmm. are horrendous. Um, and I th think it was about the same time as Lightroom gave the ability to like plug in presets and what have you. Um, it's like, I've never been one to want to pervert the pro photographic process. Does that make <laughs> sense? Um, the camera is a camera. It's kind of a documentary process. You know? Yeah. Um, if I want to make an illustration, I use illustrator, you know, uh, um, which I generally don't. I'm like I make logos and I make other things, but like if I'm designing things, I use Illustrator. If I want to document something, I use a camera. Right. So, do you feel like you have a certain visual style? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I feel like people could link even some of the design work that I've done to the photographic work that I do. There's a minimal. There's a minimalism there. Um, I, hopefully it's about you know leaving stuff out as opposed to including too much hmm. um, and like I mean I'm a big one for 
like I mean originally like coming from being an abstract painter I was like all right I want my photographs to be as abstract as they can um, and I actually recently started a another Instagram account because yes I need another one um, but like just about architectural abstractions which is one of the first things that made me want to take photographs right so it's just about experimenting and being able to go right. You know, this you, you can try this out for six months and then forget about it. it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Like, I have a pretty established style with the stuff that I do. I'm not, you know, I'm not Bill Henson from an Australian perspective, or I'm not, you know, Jeff Wall or what have you. Mm -hmm. But like, I sell the prints, um, and I feel like I can mess around and just play with things. Yeah, give yourself the ability to be able to do new stuff and try new things without boxing yourself into a certain place. Yeah. My friend Dan Avard is an amazing photographer. He does like he, he was a commercial headshot portrait photographer for years. And now, he, now he's doing an MFA. And so he's like, you know, I oh. went to his show over the weekend um, and he is just like, does crazy stuff in the best kind of way. You know, like he printed one of his huge, he printed one of his images onto a, I can't remember the dimensions, but it was like two by three meter piece of chiffon, you know, wow. like it was hanging in the gallery space on Friday night. It's cool. You know, that's cool. Like, don't, don't be too tied into things. Like just enjoy it. Um, do you ever worry about repetition of imagery? Like you're, you're shooting, do you ever feel like you're shooting the same image over and over again? Oh, a hundred percent. Um, but I mean, having like, I mean, I spent time doing life drawing, um, and like you just shoot, you just draw the same model. Two minute poses for an hour. Hmm. Thirty drawings is the same person. Um, and photographs are not the same, but you can still adjust lots of things. You know, and like I mean, I did a portrait. What two weeks ago? I did a local, did a shoot for a theater group. I shot twelve headshots in an hour. Um, and I hadn't done anything like that for a while. I was like, all right, underexpose, overexpose, and then mess around. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, like a lot of it's just ex is experimentation um, and tr just trying to figure out. It's problem solving, like a lot of stuff. Uh, you just got to figure out what you're doing, figure out what makes sense, uh, know what the end process is. If it's a book or an exhibition or a theater program, like just kind of get it done, figure out how it works the best. Um, so you work on a lot of long-term series. Like, why is that? I don't know. Um, maybe because I've sort of bounced around the world quite a bit. Um, I've moved a lot. I've lived in – I calculated at one point I've lived in like 19-plus – different abodes in 45 years that's the same um, so it's like i just like I, like it's not that i ever feel i'm tethered but like place is kind of important um yeah. and some places really speak to me like being in berlin really speaks to me being in tokyo really speaks to me parts of melbourne really speak to me um and so like capturing those places is 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 part of the process you know and it's just the idea of document over a long period of time so that you can see the changes. Yeah. yeah. But do you ever work on any kind of short series? Um, I did make a book, the one day photo book thing. Hmm. Um, so I had a coffee with a friend and then had nothing on. I just kept on shooting. Hmm. By the time I got home at nine o'clock or something, I had basically 80 ish photographs. By midnight, I'd sent the book off to a print-on-demand publishing thing, and within two weeks, I had a book on my front doorstep. Wow. You know? That's so cool. You know, I almost feel like I need to do that again soon because it was just like there was no bullshit. There was no messing around. It was just like make pictures, see what happens. And that was about 10 years ago. I feel like I know my cameras better. I know, know the way everything works better. I could make more interesting photographs. So what is your organization like when it comes to creating work? Like, do you 
edit work as soon as you shot it? Do you sit on it for a while? Do you come back to it after a few years? Generally, I photograph and then it's done. Um, I will go through, like I'll finish shooting in a particular place and I can go through my camera on the back and just delete a bunch of stuff. I bet I come home. I might back up the entire thing somewhere else just in case. Mm. Um, but like, and then I'll come back to the end of that process and have like maybe, maybe maximum five or six images. Definitely edit a couple up pretty quickly. Again, back up the short list so they're all kind of safe. Um, so you can come back and look at things in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Uh, but like, I don't sit on stuff long. Um, hmm. Often, I mean, there's a bunch of, there's a, three or four people I've worked with on regular basis over the years. And sometimes it's like, by the time they get home, I will have posted an, in, in, an image on Instagram already. It'd be edited, ready to go, done, finished. Wow. Uh, because I don't put a huge amount of editing into the process. Hmm. Uh, I figure out a lot of stuff in camera. If I don't know what it is, I'll figure it out. Um, but I don't rely too much on Photoshop. I don't rely too much on on anything. I try and get get a right in camera is the most important thing. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you, like, how do you choose how to edit your work if you're going to edit it? Minimum intervention to use a wine to use a wine term. Um, but I try and stick it as close to what it looks like in that camera as I can. Mm. Um, and generally, I will have played with you know, ups and downs and the basic nuances. Um, if I've blown a highlight, it's kind of game over. you kind of got to use a different image. Hmm. Um, I really try not to mess with stuff too much. Um, generally, I know what I'm shooting, so I can dial it in after a little bit of messing around and get what I want. If it's, I mean, I don't really do a lot, but like, I was trying to do some traffic long exposure stuff recently because I hadn't done it for years. I was like, all right, first two minutes of messing around were kind of crap. Then got it right. I'm like, it's not what I want, but I can do that. I know I can do that. Yeah. Um, so it's like, I don't rely too much on editing. It's all about like knowing that I can get the image that I want up here, looking at all the stuff. That's interesting because I feel like, we live in a society that's very like Instagram filter. It's very like, oh, heavy editing. It's very like, is this a photograph or a painting? It's, you know, and it's not a bad thing because there's a lot of photographers I know, especially create work that is very beautifully edited, but it's also very far removed from what the original image was. Yeah. I mean, I've been fascinated. One of my favorite photographers is a guy called Marcus Lair. He's in Berlin. Um, he makes nuts long exposure industrial stuff in really cool parts of Berlin. And like he's, if I'm not mistaken, I'd have to check all the bits and pieces, but he's getting ready to do a, like a mid journey exhibition. Hmm. So he's given mid journey, a bunch of prompts. Um, and I think he's making prints out of it and hanging it somewhere. Like, good on him. I don't know how he does it. Like I like his photographs more, but I still understand knowing his images as I've known them for a whole bunch of years, um, I totally see where he's going. It's just a different, it's a different creative extension. And I don't think at this point we've been doing it long enough where we can say it's, we certainly can't say it's bad. Why is it not a good thing? You know, I mean, Nick Barkworth's doing the same thing. Like he's got a whole bunch of mid journey stuff that he's working on. And like, it's certainly not his photographs, but I don't hate it, you know. Hmm. I'm a documentarian. I mean, my favorite films to watch are somehow based on documentary, um, and photographically is the same. My, this is probably why I make the books that I make and all the other stuff that I make. You know? So what is the biggest challenge of being a photographer? Um, trying to find a way to I – mean, this. Every city, be it London or New York or Melbourne, has cliches. Yeah. And many, many layers of cliches. And trying to find a way to escape those visual cliches is a real challenge. Uh, it's like you can go on Instagram and search the hashtag Melbourne photography 
and all these things will come up and a lot like not all of it but some of it will be repetitive images of you know Flinders Street Station or what have you and trying to find a way to uniquely present the place that you're in is a is an interesting challenge you know um and look, I'm working on this exhibition right now, and it's probably going to be a thing where I literally pump it out in like four days. Um, because the ideas are in my head, I just got to go and make the images. But like, it's it's called Edge Lens. It's watching our city expand because it's changed so much on the edges, as opposed to being on the more inner city sort of mm. vibe. Um, so seeing how that works is a, is a real challenge. Um, like sometimes you got to put yourself out of your little comfort zone and make some pictures which you're not used to making. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And it's always, I think, also a big challenge is when you have an idea for a project. It's like, how are you going to photograph that project? Yeah, I've come back to my high street project, and I'm actually thinking. I mean, sure, I've, there's a book sitting there which I could just produce hmm. probably within a few weeks. But I'm actually beginning to go, all right, so they're unpeopled. Maybe I need to integrate some portraits of people who've lived in that neighbourhood for X amount of time and give that a second book in three or five years a different dimension to it. Um, every place has got an angle, and sometimes it's people, sometimes it's buildings, sometimes it's weather, sometimes it's... Yeah, I mean, there's like lots, there's lots of aspects to everything. Um, just See, depends that, on what you choose, depends on what you choose to focus on when you're making your pictures. Um, See, that's actually really interesting because when I was in, I was in Brighton in July. So I was in Brighton, and when I was in Brighton, I was obviously shooting images as you do. But I kind of when I was there, I was kind of thinking like I'd love to create portraits and have a book. So I was thinking about it, which is funny because I don't think in terms of books. But I was like, it'd be yeah. cool to create like a book, go to like some kind of seaside resort that's like a popular seaside resort, whether it's Blackpool, whether it's Brighton, and talk to the people yeah. there. And take pictures of the people there and ask them why they're here and ask them about the place. Because I feel like for me, going to the seaside is cool because I don't live near the sea and it's a very alien place. But it's also nice sure. to kind of get a gauge on like the people there who live there. So it's funny to say that about yeah. people because I feel like if you shoot images of places, I feel like people are like the next extension, I think. It's almost kind of like that's going yeah. to be their next logical step. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and I mean, I've only come to that in the last five years and in 20 years of making photographs, like mm. that's a pretty new thing for me. Um, mm. And again, going back to that thing that I was talking about, about like, you know, kind of accidentally taking a photo of a guy buying a porno a bunch of years ago. Mm. Like, People are pretty particular about like making, having their photograph taken. Yeah, uh, I remember being in the U.S. in on a train in either Washington or New York with my eight, then eighteen-month-old daughter, and all these people just coming up and going, "Can we take your photograph of your kid?" And I was like, "Screw you! <laughs> That's just weird." So yeah. like. Um, I get why people don't want to be photographed, um, but also like, I mean, I would never publish a photograph of somebody unless they were a part of the process. Yeah. Um, I mean, having you know, like, I think I learned that lesson about again fifteen years ago. I, I had an exhibition in the place I was working. And like it was, it was called People in Place. I did it with a friend, friend Robert Young, um, and he we basically just took photos of people in the city. And somebody walked into the restaurant and said, "That's my friend." I was like, "Holy shit! It's three million people. What are the possibilities?" Um, yeah. But like nobody was stressed out about it. But it's always made me very conscious of sharing photographs of people particularly printing show photographs of people um, unless they're paying me to do it or it's it's a process like you gotta be careful um i think it depends on how you approach the person and the situation i think yeah because if yeah. you make it very obvious at the start like let's just say you're creating a photo project that might be a photo a photo book and you say to them 
you know, this may be a photo book, your, your photo may be printed and you get that, like maybe they get like, contact details or something and be like, oh, this is going to be like a mock-up or whatever. Although saying that, it yeah. like, could be, it could get quite messy if you have a lot of people, but it's kind of like, I think, yeah, you have to, I do agree Like you have to kind of figure out the nuances of like permission and consent when it comes to pictures of people, I think. Oh, really right. When I actually had a, I met, through my then day job, I met an IP lawyer. Um, and I actually really need to, I have a card somewhere, I really need to engage her properly because at some point I'm sure I'll run into some issues. Um, hmm. Right now I intend to work with smaller groups of people um, and like, and I tend to avoid images of actual people, but you need to be careful because people are sensitive about that stuff. Yeah. Of course, um, of but course. then again, when you like one of the, the one of the first books that I read when I came to Australia twenty five years ago now was about Australia has some of the strictest privacy laws in the world. Like mm. there's no outdoor surveillance, whereas in the UK you actually yes. have Big Brother, like George Orwell oh. wrote about. Yeah, 70. I was going to just say. Yeah, I was going to say it's uh, funny that people are wary. Of cameras when you take like when you take a camera bag people look at you but like when you carry a camera yeah. down the street people look at you but we're here in the uk especially we are yeah. always on cctv you can't escape it whereas i mean the cameras like everybody's got a camera my yeah. 15 year old daughter's got a camera and my mother has a camera who's 72 and yeah. you know everybody shoots photos of people all the time but like when you bring out a suddenly you bring out a real camera it's a threat it's Oh yeah, weird. yeah. People give you <laughs> very strange looks when you're walking down the street with the camera, yeah. which is what I've learned. Yeah, they'll either they'll the graphic either, design, the yeah. graphic designer, and slightly like possibly dodgy guy goes, "I'll just, I'll just in design up a, a shonky press pass and be like, I'm, I'm with the press. What do you want? Yeah, haven't done that. Probably could do that. Wouldn't yeah. do it. But no. like that's the kind of thing that give that gives people like. I mean, you dress up in a police uniform, are you suddenly a cop? The problem is that I feel like when I'm out and about with the camera, people either look at you weirdly, but they avoid you. It's kind of interesting, actually. It's kind of, yeah. I just find like it's really interesting because people just like stare at you like, what you're doing? And they just avoid you completely because they don't want to be on camera, which I think is funny. Or they, or they'll harass right. you and ask you what you're doing. They'll either yeah. leave you alone or just ask you, or constantly ask you what you're doing, which is annoying either way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just like, People are just not used to seeing cameras. It's a very strange thing. Which is strange. Uh, which is very strange. And also people act like photography isn't a thing. Yeah. Like the amount of times I've been asked, like, what are you taking a picture of? Or what are you doing that for? And I'm just a bit like, yeah. am I disturbing you? I remember I was shooting an image down a, um, of like an island in the middle of a road at night. And some woman drove past me, reversed and came back up to me and was like, what are you doing? I was just yeah. like, I'm like, you're driving past. You can keep driving. Like, yeah, I'm literally out here taking a picture of literally an empty space. Yeah. But she was a bit like, oh, I should probably call the police. It's dodgy. And I'm like, no, it's fine. I'm literally taking a picture <laughs> of an empty road. And it's like when yeah. I was in, it's like when I was in Blackpool, like there's the Pleasure Beach security stopped me and they were like, oh, you've been taking pictures of all these doorways. It looks really suspicious. And I'm like, they look, they're really interesting. And they couldn't, they yeah. didn't understand that. Like I said, I'm a photographer. It was like, you know, I'm here on holiday to take images. They couldn't understand why I'd want to be taking pictures of like doorways. Yeah, I've like, read this. I feel like since like just post nine eleven, which is yeah. kind of that when I started taking photographs. That's one of like that <laughs> that's one of the thing. Now, as the explosion of the internet was kind of happening at the same time, and um, like you now you need to. This is why I have business cards and a website yeah. and an identity because it's like I'm not just doing this today. I've got like terabytes of images i've been yeah. doing it for decades um and i can call i can have you call a politician's office for them because they will yeah. vouch for me um yeah. like because a lot of people who aren't in the little world that we live in just don't get it yeah um, yeah and i actually always forget how suspicious it actually probably does look yeah i always forget i'm I mean, so, I'll, yeah I'm packing a maybe an 85 mil lens, probably a 50 mil lens. I don't have. I sold all my zoom lenses years ago. Like I use prime lenses, and that's mm. what I use. 
imagine these people who walk around with three or four hundred and fifty yeah. mil is doing stuff like that's definitely a bit dodgy. Hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But yeah, I, I always forget. Like sticking a one, particularly at night, if you're wandering around at night with a camera, it does look a bit dodgy. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But at the same time, it's like your intentions are honest. You're not, you know. And I feel like I mean, I've got a website and yeah, hundreds of interviews of night photography to be like, yeah, you, you got this is timing. This I need to get some business cards actually. That's a good idea actually. That I need to do that. So I'm just like, oh no, I'm a photographer, and then just run off. Yeah. No, like that's something I read years ago on probably Flickr or something going, just have business cards. It will yeah. shut people up very quickly because it means, it means that you show that you're important. Uh, not important, but you take it yeah. seriously. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Um, I'm going to actually invest in that. That's a good idea, actually. The uh, guys that move, you print in the UK, oh, do yeah. amazing work. Oh, absolutely. The business cards I've had previously are from Move. They're really good. They're such a good yeah. business. Such a good business. I've got a whole lot of postcards through them and like I will wait for the shipping from the UK. Oh, that must be a long time. Oh, it's, yeah, it's like over two weeks. It's stupid. Uh, but they make really, the paper is amazing. Um, try and get a, try and like hit them up, see if we can get some plugs out of it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> actually, that's actually not finished. There. One thing that I need to actually do for the podcast is sponsors. I need to think yeah, about totally. who, I need to think about, because if, if I was going to have sponsors or whatever, I'd actually want to have sponsors that I'd actually use. People that I actually, yeah. You know, like businesses that are actually interested in. So actually, that's a really I mean, good. Years ago, I had a um, so my again going back to my weird weird connections around the world. But my cousin, or no, my mom, my cousin's my mom's cousin's daughter was chief graphic designer at Vogue in London. Wow, oh, that's insane! Uh, and she came out here, and we, we were like, you know, she lives somewhere like other end of the country now but like we had an exhibition together and like we oh. just sat down and brainstormed stuff and like we got like cases of free wine because we literally just like put a wine company's um logo on our website um oh. and on the like and so like using all those using the connections and all that sort of stuff makes a huge difference um so that is interesting because I have a, a pretty good artist friend very, very recently who is just, he, as a joke, he emailed a bunch of brands so he can draw images for them because he's a really great illustrator. And they all actually responded, yeah. well, a lot of them responded to him saying, yeah, sure. So like now yeah, he's got cool. himself a bunch of work just from literally messaging people. Uh, yeah, and I he mean, didn't I, expect I, it. So I volunteered my photography portrait stuff to politicians and they pay you 500 bucks for two hours work. No. That's decent. That's very decent. <laughs> That's so cool. It doesn't work every day, but it, like when it happens, yeah. like it means you got to like. I mean, I have a, I have an Excel spreadsheet of hundreds of companies hmm. and people. And like uh, every couple of days, I just send out a thing. Yeah. Um, and sometimes yeah. you volunteer stuff, but other times you're like, no, you need to pay for it. Yeah. I mean, some people of course. Like, no get it. Other times you're like. When I did the theater stuff over the last month or so, and they were like, those volunteer thing. They were, they were grateful. I was grateful. Um, but it's like other people, it's like, it's going to cost you 200 bucks. Other people, it's going to cost you a thousand bucks. It just depends on the size of your company and how it works and how it works for everybody, you know? Yeah, I'll never into that, actually. It's a stupid question, as a teacher might say, you know? You know, actually, I've got to look into that. I feel like. I'm at a point now with the podcast, especially where like actually that wouldn't be a bad idea to think about actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, I'm gonna think about that. See, if I was in, if I was doing a podcast here, I'd be like, all right, I hit up the the guys, Image Science, who does my print, who's done a lot of my printing, hmm. or Hamuel with the paper, or yeah. MVP, who does the, who's printed the the PBN books for me. Um, or, you know, like there's all these different companies and you use so many different people to get all yeah. this stuff done. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That's cool. And like, That's such cool. I'm going to think about yeah. it. Actually. And I, like, I need to re I need to think about that again myself. Yeah. Just sure. to adjust the list, you know, it's a big thing. Right. So I have a question for you from the last person I interviewed. I technically have two questions because I've interviewed somebody else since, but I'll ask you the question that I originally sent you, but I'll ask you another question also. 
So right, the question, okay. so one question is from a really cool artist called Naza Young, who actually I think you'd really like his work. I think it'd be really up your street. So his yeah. question for you is, if you could create the ideal space to present yourself and your work in, what would that look like? Oh, wow. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to my, like, sort of Midwestern roots from the U.S., um, which also links up to Berlin on a musical level. Um, and there was a place in Berlin for many years which I got to visit called Tackley's. Uh, probably not quite the right pronunciation, but um, it's basically an old old building which was repurposed into artist studios. Cool. Uh, um, and so it was like typical Berlin, like six to eight stories, like a lot of particularly London and other parts of you know Europe are. Um, but like an old repurposed industrial building into a cool sort of curved space. Um, definitely like kind of edgy, a bit dark. Um, gotta have some music, gotta have some booze. Um, yeah, not necessarily a pristine white gallery would hmm. be what interests me. Um, bit of a contrast to the show that I'm going to have in this architecture firm in about six or eight weeks because that's totally like a beautiful, pristine space. But, mm. yeah, like it's good to be able to mix stuff up and mess stuff around, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such a good idea. I think the presentation of the work, especially in person, is so yeah. important. I mean, I feel like what I really love to do at some point, I've thought about it for years, I just never get around to it, is just like, you know, really – almost duo turning something in Photoshop and then going to a photocopy place and making flyers and putting thousands of them or hundreds of them around the city. Mm. Yeah. Uh, um, the way we have now with QR codes and whatever else, like you can build a whole thing around that. You can have an exhibition in the street and if you build it properly, yes. it doesn't matter. Uh, That's a good idea. That's a really good idea actually, using the outside as yeah. an exhibition space. And Almost particularly like, here, in, we have this crazy street uh, art situation where there's street art everywhere, and, like, you can tap into that. Hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's interesting, actually. That's a really good consideration, actually, in terms of like how you can utilize what's already there as opposed to having to buy a space or rent a space out or having to kind of, yeah. like, you know, yeah. spend money doing something that's going to only be temporary when actually you could use what's already around you in a way that's, you know, legal and safe and, and you know, uh, correct. It doesn't necessarily part. have to be legal, but can I know. Be safe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But safe uh, then. Yeah. 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 This is the most important thing. Legal, yeah, maybe not so much. <laughs> um, but yeah. like, you know, basically, you don't want to be out there and harming people. Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, that's the real key to anything is not harming people. But like you can, you can. I mean, I I'm begin. I got a postcard. Actually, I wouldn't call it a postcard. It was a black and white A5 piece of paper that had been photocopied about some people who were doing uh, postcard distribution in my neighborhood. Hmm. Um, and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. So now I'm actually I got a job distributing postcards. So basically, I'm going to get paid to wander around distributing postcards and they're going to pay me. It's not a lot of money, but it's just like I'll get paid to wander around with my camera and take photos mm. and stuff. It's um, a dual purpose, yeah. There's, there's a, an alternative yeah. motive that's going to actually benefit you. Uh, I don't want to, like, I've had the same job the same amount of time. I don't want to do that all the time. Yeah. Just figure out a different way to make things work. Um, so, you know, that's, I'm going to explore that over the next couple of days and just see where that goes. Um, yeah. Yeah, to give yourself the time and the options to explore different things. Yeah, which, like, I think going before COVID, everybody was just, like, work all the time. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, definitely yeah, been I'm a just, shift. There's definitely been a shift. Yeah. No, but, I'm just like, I don't want to work all the time. I want to do something that's more interesting. Um, yeah, I'm you know. definitely at that point. I'm definitely at that point in my life right now where I'm, like, I don't want to be working all the time. Yeah. Well, if I'm mean, happy to work all the time, but I want to be working on what I want to work on. Yes, that's what I mean. You want the work to be something that you enjoy doing that you can get paid for, but it's also like you're not working. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so finding a way to make that work is, is really Yeah. Uh, 
So I have a second question, which is from the last person I interviewed, an artist called Emma Carr. And her question for you is, what is a photograph? What is a photograph? Oh, wow. Okay. So photograph is a digital or physically based image created with light because photograph is going back to, you know, classics and what have you. Photograph drawing with light. Um, and I think there's lots of ways to diverge from that. I mean, you look at something like Man Ray, you can do, I mean, I did at one point when I was doing some study, I did, um, ah, I can't remember what it's called anymore, but, you know, you drop a whole bunch of objects onto a piece of photo paper, expose it, then pull them off again. Like that, I don't know if that's a photograph or not. But drawing with light is really the key. It's like that's the most strictest definition of what a photograph is. Um, but finding a way to push what you take photographs of is really the challenge. You know? hmm. um, I bought a flash recently and I'm looking at like and some reflectors and bits and pieces. I've got some empty beer cans. At some point in the next week or two, I'll just take photos of that because I like is, beer and I like photos and we'll see where it goes. You know? Is there a certain subject that you would like to photograph that you haven't done yet? Yeah. Like that's, I mean, I do feel like there's an amazing possibility, like the political and sort of social power of photography and the documentary photography and being able to go to a place like be it Syria or, I don't know, North Korea or somewhere like that, Iran, and be able to document what goes on in those places and be able to help people, I think mm -hmm. is a really important thing. Um, yeah, like, I mean, I feel like a lot of what I do is a bit self indulgent. <laughs> um, of course. And it'd be, good to, it'd be good to find a way to have a more socially aware reason for making photographs. Um, I don't want to just take photographs of homeless people because that also seems slightly abusive yeah. on some level. Yeah. Uh, but finding the right socio, socio, social reasons for making the pictures to bring people's plights to the attention of the people who can possibly make a difference about them is a really important thing. Yeah. You know, think about homelessness. We have a massive housing crisis in Melbourne. Yeah. Um, our popular have ballooned by like 200% in 20 years. Um, nobody's keeping up with producing houses. So there's lots of homeless people. Um, okay. So finding a way to bring their plight into, it's already a part of the discourse, but be able to better what they have would be really important. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. It's a social, it's a social documentary. It's a social course kind of situation. Be able to help people would be really important. So I think, it's a great, I think it's a great idea, personally. I think so. It's nice. It's nice that you want to do something with your work that is for people who are less fortunate and/or to raise awareness of something, as opposed to just always being self-indulgent. Not that there's anything wrong with being self-indulgent. I don't think there is personally, but I do like the idea of creating change. There's got to be you know? like you can't do. You shouldn't just be doing one thing. I suppose hmm. um, there should be a positive force behind it as well as just being there to be pretty or enjoyable or whatever, right? Hmm. Like, um, you know, we have environmental issues and we have social issues and finding a way to deal with those is, is really important. Um, sure as hell haven't figured it out, but I would very much like to. You know? So do you have a question for the next artist I interview? Oh, hopefully I'll put this in my, uh, my email, but... <laughs> I might have to get back to you on that one. Um, yeah. You did you did uh, put something in here. You put is there an art form you've always dreamed you've always dreamt of uh, trying? What, all right, what? yeah. Yeah. This is like, yeah, that's a good point. Like I have lots of people I know who have only ever done one or two things. Um, mm. and I've done a lot of different things. So yeah, okay. Yeah. That's a that's a good one. I'll, cool. I'll back myself. On that. That, um, that perfect. I about to say no, you did. I've got it here. I was like, because hmm. that's the, the one question that I'm like, if I ask anybody a question, if that's the only question I ask you in the next two hours, 
has to be that question because it, yeah. it's like a link from like it's, I don't. Is it creates a that creates a narrative thread across everything you're doing. Absolutely, and I can reference you in the next interview. Although last time I did an interview with Emma, I completely forgot to ask her, and I had to text her after and be like, "Could you send me a question?" Because I've got an interview in about two days, and I was like, "I need a question," because uh, yeah. I forgot to ask her. And uh, three hours we were talking, I completely forgot to ask her, and I was like, "Oh, I didn't ask you." Even though it's highlighted, it's the only thing that's highlighted that I should have realized myself. Um, yeah. So yeah. only got about three more questions left, just so you are aware. Okay. Yeah. So sounds good. What has creating art taught you about yourself? Oh, that's interesting. Um, what is, uh, that's quite hard. Um, look, I do surprise myself. Um, sometimes you just got to experiment and see where it goes. Um, again, it kind of goes back to maybe the talking about that like one day photo book that I made. Sometimes you can't be too precious about what you make. You just got to do it. Um, yeah, and I've, I'm like, I've, I think a lot of what I did for a long time was just about making one kind of photograph, hmm. which is fine because, you know, most people, yeah, like, it is what it is. But it's like, there's a lot of aspects to photography and you can continue to learn for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I, and this is why I have, you know, this is why I happened upon. This is why I bought lights, um, because I'm like I saw them on uh, saw them on Facebook Marketplace. I'm like that would be interesting. Um, makes you explore different things and certainly different places. Um, and I've deliberately got on trains or buses and gotten lost in my own city just to make pictures. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, and I've done that in lots of other cities as well, but I do it here more often because this is where I am. Um, yeah, yeah, I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Very relatable, actually. That very relatable. Um, so the second to last question, which is, yeah. what would your younger self think about your work? Yeah, good question. Um, I feel like I've been pretty impressed. Like I love the evolution of being able to give myself um when i have somewhere around i have a photograph i took in france in 2003 um it's pretty much 20 years old um and there's still a rep there's still this like i have a vision and i think going that goes back to you know paul from sachi and sachi um hmm. you know 30 odd years ago like I know what I'm. I know what I'm quite good at making, um, and it's not everybody's thing because you know nobody likes everything. Um, yeah. But I have, I believe in the work that I make. Um, I love what I make. When um, I have a vision, there's a, there's a style that I have, and I like making those photos, and that's what is also reflected in the books that I make and all the other bits and pieces that I do, like. I have some sort of background as an aesthetic backbone to what I'm making. Um, and that's from, you know, 40 plus years of messing around with stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely awesome. And the last question, which I'd be glad to know, which is <laughs> <laughs> I always tell the people, everyone's like, yeah. And I'm like, you don't want to say yeah. But that's funny. People was like, yeah. I mean, five hours later, people are like, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> so. <laughs> So the last question is, what are you currently working on? And where can people find more about you and your work? I'm currently working on my website. Uh, yes. Which I, had, which I haven't had for a while. Um, it may be done in any day now. Um, if you stay tuned to my Instagram account, mm. you'll definitely see when it's ready. Um, but I'm also working on, I'm very close to finishing a, an urban book, um, which is focusing on the features of a photographer called Doug McGoldrick in Chicago um, and a whole bunch of other people from around the world. Um, also, I'm doing some graphic design studies, so I'm kind of trying to finish that, which seems funny at age 45, but, you know, That's good, qualifications. Um, so, yeah, the, I have plastic exhibition. Jesus, I'm doing way too much. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, those four things. That's enough. Um, 
Andrew, thank you so much for your time. No, absolute pleasure. I had a blast. That concludes my conversation with photographer Andrew Wester. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions or comments about it, please send me an email at theflyingfruitbowl at gmail.com or get in touch via social media sites such as Facebook and Instagram. The Flying Fruit Bowl podcast can be found on a variety of sites such as Spotify, YouTube and Apple Music. If you like the show, please consider rating, reviewing, sharing or subscribing on any of these platforms to help spread the word. Also, please don't forget to check out theflyingfruitbowl.co.uk for daily art inspiration and if you're a creative, please get in touch for a chance to be featured or interviewed. Flying Free Bowl podcast now also has a Patreon page if you're interested in supporting the platform further. To hear start for £1, and more information can be found over at patreon.com forward slash the Flying Free Bowl. Additionally, if monthly donations are not your thing, we have a PayPal for one time donations. I'll include a link in the show notes. Once again, thank you very much for listening today, folks. Until next time, please stay safe.